Okay, everybody. Thank you all for coming. I'm Summer. Uh, I'm Summer. I'm the curator here at the museum. Before we get started, everybody, please take a second to turn off or silence your phone so we don't have any disruptions. Um, as for announcements, this month we have three programs in celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month. So the first one is this Friday at 6 p.m. It's a Florida Humanities Florida Talk lecture entitled Afro-Caribbean Migration to Cuba, or not Cuba, sorry, uh, to Florida with Magdalena Lamar. And then next on the 17th, we'll have the opening of our new temporary exhibit entitled The Cuba Connection. It's a juried exhibit of contemporary art, and our speaker is Dr. Berta Arias, who you can see right there. Uh, she'll talk about the unique connection between Cuba and Fernandina. And then on the next day, Saturday the 18th, we'll have Fiesta de Santa Maria at the Farmer's Market, which will include Hispanic music, living history, performances. Um, so we hope to see you all at these events. There are flyers at that back table if you need information about the times and everything. Um, and then our next brown bag on October 6th will be with John Royale from the St. Mary's Tall Ship Alliance, who will talk about the history of tall ships. Um, also, if you have an evaluation sheet near you, please take a second at the end of the program to fill it out and then return it to that basket at the back table. Um, so that's it for announcements. So I'll just introduce myself. I am the speaker today. Um, <laughs> some professional background slash academic background. I went to FSU and I got a degree in art history and history. And then I went to UF and got a master's in museum studies. I stayed at UF for about a year working in the special collections department of the library. Um, in the pan it was a collection about Panama Canal, so that was really interesting. Um, and then I moved here in late 2020 and I got this job. Yay! So. Okay, so to get started with the talk, um, this talk is about the first images of Florida that were disseminated in Europe. Um, they were published in a book for the general public with a really snazzy title. It was called A Brief Narration of Those Things Which Befell the French in the Province of Florida in America. Uh, and it was published in 1591. So this is an image from that book. And this book was based on a French expedition to the Jacksonville area in the late, late 16th century. So you'll learn a little bit about that expedition. Um, you'll also learn a little bit about the Chimuqua people who inhabited the area. And then we'll also look at the authenticity of these images and the ongoing debate about them among scholars. Um, so this person, Theodore de Bry, is probably the most important character in this story because he engraved the book that we'll be talking about. He was born in 1528 and he was a professional engraver and he was born into a family of professional engravers. Um, this is a self-portrait and you can see how finely detailed it is. Um, so that's because he was working on copper plates which was a relatively new technology at the time. So you would take copper, you would etch into it with a sharp tool, you would ink it, and then run it through a press, and it would create this. Um, so this comes after wood cuts, which was kind of similar idea, but you're doing it with wood, and it's harder to get such fine detail. Um, so this technology would allow him to create these finely detailed images of the new world. And although he engraved these images of the New World, he never actually stepped foot in America. So um, that'll become a bigger part of our story later on. 
Um, so here's a little taste of what this book he engraved was like. This is the first engraving in it, showing the French arriving in Florida. Again, you can see how detailed it is. It has the, the ships and the foliage in the background, the Chamuqua natives. Um, and each image had a relatively detailed caption. This is just a snippet of it. Um, so imagine that you're a French person in 1591 with a pretty limited knowledge of America and listen to this account of the French expedition. So it says, on landing on the shore of this river, our men saw many Indians who came on purpose to give them a most kind and friendly reception as their actions proved. For some of them gave their own skin garments to the commander and promised to point, point out to him their chief who did not rise up but remained sitting on boughs of laurel and palm which had been spread for him. He gave our commander a large skin, decorating it all over with pictures of various kinds of wild animals drawn after the life. Um, so you can see that the caption corresponds with the image. So here's our chief sitting down. Here are the Tamukua people um, with the skin garments. And here are the French arriving. Um, so, if Debray never stepped foot in America, where did he get this information? That's where our second main character comes in. So, Jacques Lemoyne was born just five years after Debray, and he was a professional artist and cartographer, uh, aka map maker. And he was actually the first professional artist sent to the New World. Um, he was on the second French expedition to America and was sent with the following official duties, quote, to chart the seacoast and to observe the situation of the towns and the depth and course of the rivers and also the harbors, the houses of the people and anything new that might be in that province. Um, so basically, Lemoyne was the artist in residence of this expedition, and he um, apparently did complete this task. He painted watercolors of the Chamuqua people, painted what he saw, um, and created a map of Florida. Um, the story goes that Debray purchased these original watercolors from Lemoyne's widow after his death. <coughs> And then uh, Debray based his copper plate engravings on these original watercolors. Uh, at least that's what Debray writes in the introduction of his book. However, we don't have um, any of the original paintings that Lemoyne allegedly did. Uh, so we kind of have to take Debray at his word that he had access to these originals. Um, but what we do have of Lemoyne's work is about 50 botanical illustrations that he created after returning to Europe. Um, so this, these three are kind of representative of what they all look like. They're really finely detailed, they're really drawn from life, and they're all um, European botanical examples. Um, so some historical context for how and why the French got to America. Uh, this was during the French Wars of Religion in which the French Protestants, also known as Huguenots, were facing religious persecution uh, by the Catholics. This led to both of the French expeditions to America that I'll be talking about. Uh, they intended to create a French colony to flee rel religious persecution. So the first French expedition was led by this guy, Jean Ribot. He landed near the mouth of the St. John's River and put up a marker with a fleur-de-lis to claim the territory for France. And then he traveled north to modern-day South Carolina and established a fort called Charles Fort. And he stayed there for about two years uh, before the supplies dried up and they had to return back to Europe. And then France's second expedition to the Americas was led by the second guy, uh, René de Laudonnière. And he was actually second in command during Ribot's expedition. Uh, the second expedition was the one that the artist Lemoyne was a part of. And this was also an attempt to establish a Huguenot colony. Um, so during this expedition, they established Fort Caroline near present-day Jacksonville. 
Uh, even today, we don't know exactly where Fort Caroline was, but in Jacksonville, the National Park Service has a recreation of it, uh, which I haven't visited, but I feel like I need to after this talk. <laughs> um, and this is an engraving um, from this book that I'll be talking about. And just a note that whenever it says plate number, uh, that means it, it's an engraving from the book. And plate is referring to the copper plates that they're done on. Um, so how do we know about Fort Caroline? There were actually three narratives written about it um, by people on that second expedition. So there was a narrative by Lemoyne, the artist. There was a narrative by Laudonnaire, who was the leader of the expedition. And then there's also a narrative by a man named Nicholas Chalot, who was a carpenter. And uh, this was a fairly short expedition. It lasted just over a year. And towards the end, relations with the Timucua were deteriorating. The French were running out of food. Uh, and some of the French colonists became pirates and raided the Spanish ships. And then uh, Ribot, the leader from the first expedition, later came and uh, joined to help. So um, the entrance of the Spanish is where things really turned downhill for this expedition. Um, Spain claimed Florida based on their previous um, expeditions there. So this man, Pedro, de Me Pedro Menendez, was sent by King Philip II of Spain uh, with instructions to remove the French Protestants from Florida. And they attacked in 1565. Lemoyne was one of the few survivors who was able to sail back to Europe, as was uh, Laudonnaire. And unfortunately, Ribot didn't make it, so you can see that on that column. Um, and we don't know exactly, but it seems likely that Lemoyne was able to survive because he was so familiar with um, the land, having been the cartographer for it. And um, this is where the, the first sort of big question about Lemoyne's artworks comes in. So, uh, you know, did his original watercolors survive and make it back to Europe? Um, some argue that it seems unlikely in the chaos of the Spanish raid. However, there is a written account that Lemoyne presented his findings to the king when he got back to Europe. So um, some postulate that he may have um, recreated the images from memory when he got back to Europe. Um, and the, the sort of main book about this, about Lemoyne rather, is by a journalist. It's called Painter in a Savage Land, and it's pretty interesting. It's written by a journalist, so it's actually written well rather than a historian. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that means that some of his evidence is kind of shaky sometimes. But anyway, he writes on um, sort of imagining what Lemoyne would have felt like as he's boarding the ships. He says, uh, having just endured a famine, having just been wounded in war, um, Lemoyne was apparently shot by um, the Timucua. Having just witnessed the massacre of his countrymen, that's referring to the Spanish, um, he was now entering a vast churning ocean amid storms of stunning violence with only biscuits and water to live on and barely enough clothing to cover his back. Yet for all that, he must have known that whatever perils awaited him at sea, he was lucky to be alive. So uh, Lemoyne makes it back to France, but unfortunately he also faced religious persecution there. Um, he fled France after the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of the Huguenots, and he um, settled in London for the rest of his life. Um, so now that I've kind of introduced the European piece of this, um, I want to talk about the Tumukua, who are the people who the, Fran the French encountered in Florida. Uh, they inhabited southern Georgia and northeast Florida, so that's including Fernandina. Um, they weren't one homogenous group, but rather they had many different chiefdoms who shared a common language, dialects of a common language, but they didn't see themselves as a polit politically united whole. Um, they were decimated by European diseases, and now they're considered a extinct group. And much of what we know about them is from the French accounts. 
in addition to archaeology and such. Um, so having covered the historical context, I want to get into this book of engravings that I mentioned. So there are 42 images in total, but I'm just going to go over some of the most interesting. Um, so as we're going, think about you know this story that an everyday person in France would have been reading, you know, if they bought this book. And keep in mind that these are all allegedly images of the Temuqua, allegedly based on original um, paintings by Lemoyne, but engraved by Debray. So to get started, this one. Um, shows the column that I mentioned that was erected by Jean Ribot during the first expedition. So it, it shows that um, in the meantime between the two expeditions, it had actually become an object of veneration or worship among the native people. So you can see the Temukua people um, looking at it, praying to it, whatever. Um, there's a the native chief right here, and then he's sort of presenting it to uh, René de Laudonnière. Um, this is a few plates in the future. It shows a 120-year-old sorcerer, apparently, uh, who was to report the state of affairs with uh, the the native enemy. So. This conflict is, you know, one chiefdom of the Chimucuans against another chiefdom of the Chimucuans. So it, the caption um, describes that he is knelt on a shield, he is reciting unknown words in a low tone, and gestures as if, as if engaged in a vehement discourse. He did that for about 15 minutes when he began to assume an appearance so frightful that he was hardly like a human being, for he twisted his limbs and his bones, um, twisted his limbs so his bones could be heard snap out of place, and he did many other unnatural things. So you can see his arms kind of going crazy in the background. And then apparently he steps out of his circle, he salutes the chief, and tells him the number of the enemy and where they were intending to meet him. Um, so he somehow got this information by doing this act. Um, this is just the next plate. So it shows that same um, chief. There's a war going on between the two groups, and it shows that the French are allied with uh, the chief that was shown in the previous slide. <laughs> this one, a few plates later, it shows that same sort of sorcerer. He's now doing a ceremony. Uh, there are musicians. There are people watching. Here's that same chief and René de Laudonnière. Um, and then they're doing the ceremony around war trophies. So here's a scalp, which was pretty common in um, native warfare. And then also human limbs. <laughs> Um, let's see. This one shows the modes of treating the sick. <clears throat> so it might be kind of hard to see from the back, but this guy is sucking the blood out of this sick person. And then he is going to uh, spit the blood into a container like this. And women who are breastfeeding um, would drink it, and then it would apparently make their children um, stronger, especially if the person who was sick is sort of like a strong young man. And then it shows a, a different way of treating the sick depending on the illness. So this guy is laying on his stomach, and he's um, they're smoking herbs and such, and he's going to breathe that in and then vomit it out um, and hopefully expel the disease. How much of that do we know is European influence? Because wouldn't they do that back in the day in Europe as well as bloodletting? Um, yeah, I mean, you'll see later that we don't really know how much of this is European influence at all or if <laughs> these are even true, but we'll get to it, Christopher. <laughs> um, so here's kind of another basic one. So you can see as we're going that Lemoyne 
slash Debray, they're really just being like anthropologists and they're they're recording what they see allegedly, what the Tamukwa are doing. So this is how they till and plant. Uh, this one shows them smoking animals um, to preserve the meat. There's all sorts of wacky looking <laughs> creatures. Um, this one really bothers me. <laughs> it's it's a uh, Tamuku of people using deer skins that they had already um, killed. And so they put that over their head, like a mask. You can see their eyes through it. And then, um, so they're, they're gonna shoot these deer. They're hunting deer, but hopefully if they're in these deer disguises, it won't frighten the living deer and they'll be easy targets. Um, here's kind of a fun one because of how crazy that the alligator looks. Um, he has little ears and he has long fingers and he's huge um, but it shows them ramming him to kill him and then sort of clubbing him shooting him once he's dead or to kill him more I guess <laughs> um, this one shows like a political meeting of the Tumuku people so here's the chief in the most important seat and he's drinking out of this shell um, and the shell contains something called the black drink which you might have heard about um, in other native cultures um, it's a really important ceremonial drink and so these women are preparing it and you can see some people throwing up and apparently if you if you throw up that means you're unfit for battle because you you weren't able to handle the drink um, here's another kind of basic one. So it shows a town that has a palisade around it. It shows that the chief's house is in the middle, uh, the biggest, the most important people running out of it. Um, here's a ceremony at the death of a chief or priest. So this is that same shell from a few um, slides ago. So that ceremonial shell would be on their grave, and then you could see the village people um, mourning their death. They would apparently mourn without eating or drinking for days at a time um, if a chief or a priest died. Um, so let me get a drink. So that kind of gives you a sense um, of the types of things that are in the book. And this book was circulating in um, the 16th century just among everyday people, uh, but it had a real resurgence of popularity in 1946 when it was published by an American author named Stefan or Stephen, I don't know how he pronounces it, uh, Laurent. He published it as The New World, The First Pictures of America, and he translated the text into <coughs> modern English so it was much more accessible. Um, so scholars flocked to this topic because, as you saw, the images are extremely detailed, and you know if they're true, they're a total anthropological and historical goldmine. Um, however, this is when the question of authenticity began to gain more traction. Um, so if we get into the Debray story a little more and uh, sort of circle back to how he acquired these paintings, apparently in um, 1587, Debray had met with Lemoyne, the, the artist of the original watercolors, about a different project. And he, um, he mentioned wanting to buy the Florida paintings and narrative, but Lemoyne said he was unwilling to sell them because he wanted to publish them himself. And then uh, Lemoyne unfortunately died just the next year, and Debray approached Lemoyne's widow, and she was willing to sell um, the images and narrative. At least that's what Debray reports in the introduction of his book. 
And um, as I mentioned earlier, some scholars think that Lemoyne might have lost the originals um, in the chaos of the Spanish raid. And Stéphane Laurent in this book um, reports that Lemoyne did lose the, these originals, but recreated them from memory during the latter part of his life in London. And again, that's sort of an unsubstantiated claim. Like, we don't really know how Stéphane Laurent got that information. Um, so, in other words, back to this, uh, if Debray did purchase the drawings from Lemoyne, they possibly weren't even the originals, or, but rather recreations warped naturally by memory. Um, but regardless of the circumstances of the Lemoyne originals, why did Debray want to purchase these so badly? Um, so the year prior, Debray had published a book of engravings based on watercolor paintings by the English explorer John White. They were published in another book with a snazzy title, which was called A Brief and True Report of the New Found Land of Virginia, uh, which is modern day North Carolina. And this book uh, used a narrative by the explorer Thomas Harriet, and it used in grit, or not engravings, but uh, original watercolors by the artist John White. So it's pretty much the exact same format as the, um, Florida book in that it's based off of um, first-hand drawings using first-hand words. And in the introduction of this book, Debray says that he wanted to publish the Florida volume first because the French were in Florida well before the English were in North Carolina, but again, he couldn't purchase those from Le Moyne. Um, and Jabrai would actually go on to publish 14 volumes about the Americas, all with engravings accompanied by first-hand narratives. And they all sold very well in Europe at the time. Um, so here are some images from his English narrative. They're of the Algonquin Indians. Um, but the benefit of studying this volume is that we actually do have the original watercolors by John White. So if we look at this, we can kind of get a sense of how um, Debray alters images, even if he has the originals. So you can see first off that this is done in like a much more refined European style, um, you know, the style of artwork at the time. So he, he makes little changes just to make, you know, her legs look more pleasing. He changes the stance of her feet. Her face is very Europeanized. Uh, he even does little things like changes um, her, her finger gesture. But the overall um, main idea of the image is definitely the same. But he also adds certain things that weren't in the original. So you can see that the little girl is holding a doll in both of them. But in this one, she's also holding this other object. And we don't know where that object came from. And then obviously he completely added this background that wasn't in the original. Um, here's another one. So again, John White original watercolor and then Jabrai engraving. So we can see that he again Europeanizes um, the man in general to the style at the time. He puts shoes on him for some reason. He changes his hand gesture to be a little bit more appealing, I guess. And then he completely adds the background. Um, same here. I mean, in both, they definitely look similar, but there are minor changes. Um, you know, well, let's see. Background, definitely. I'm looking for little changes in the people. Yeah, like four people here, two people here, just little things like that. Um, and then the background's totally added. And uh, we can see that he's also combining images. So this one, there was no background, but he had a reference for this background here. Okay, let's put the background for this, this man. 
uh, here's just another example. I kind of like this one because it it feels like he's almost just doing a you know a figure study of this person, asking artistically, okay, what would it look like if he were um, standing with his back facing us? Um, but the the main like details are still there. He's still wearing this square necklace, um, but the face has changed. The body is more sculpted. Um, and the background's added. And then this one, um, again, main idea, image is flipped, which, well, when you're doing engravings, it might have just naturally been flipped anyway. Um, but he completely adds these people. And so, you know, whether or not he saw represented somewhere else, like a, a person holding the meat in that way, we don't know. He could have just made it up or he might have combined them from a different um, image. But you can see he's definitely adding things that aren't in the original. Um, to go back to the Florida engravings, um, so we, we now know that Debray has a history of not representing images exactly as the originals appeared. Um, and as archaeologists studied the Florida engravings, they began to point out uh, a bunch of inaccuracies. So European facial features, the wrong type of deer, the wrong type of shells, wrong vegetation, wrong weapons, customs, the list just goes on. Um, so here's a couple examples. You'll remember this one I showed you earlier. It's this political meeting with the chief in the center drinking the black drink. Um, but he's shown drinking it out of a um, Pacific Nautilus shell. So that shell wouldn't have been found in Florida. And rather, um, he would have been drinking from a whelk shell like this. So. Um, you know, where did Debray get that shell? We, we don't know. It probably wasn't in the original if he had access to the original. And then um, I couldn't find a image of like the correct war club, but apparently this type of club here is um, a Brazilian club. So that wouldn't have been found in Florida either. Although it is an indigenous club, from somewhere in the world, just not the accurate type. Um, and then the engravings done after John White can also give us insight into the Florida engravings. So you guys remember seeing the John White original watercolor, which looked pretty much like this. Um, but then we, we compare the Debray engraving of the English uh, to the Debray engraving of Florida. And um, archaeologists point out that the Tumukua didn't have palisades around their villages. Oh. And so, well, where did Debray get this idea? He, he clearly pulled it from this. It looks almost identical. <laughs> and then here's another example. So here is the um, John White original watercolor. Here is the Debray <clears throat> engraving based on that watercolor. And then we can also see it applied to the Florida engraving. And we don't have the Lemoyne original, so we don't know what this is based off of, but it looks an awful lot like that. Um, So there are a lot of unknowns in this story. So of course, there's debate about it. Um, but if we break down what we know and what we don't know, um, according to multiple sources, Lemoyne did create paintings based on his observations in Florida and apparently did intend to publish them. But we don't know uh, whether these original paintings made it back to Europe. They might have been destroyed in the Spanish raid. He reportedly did present paintings to the king, although, again, these could have just been recreations done from memory. 
Um, and then according to Debray, he purchased Lemoyne's images and narrative from his widow. And it's certainly possible, in my opinion, that uh, Debray did purchase, you know, something from Lemoyne, or uh, from Lemoyne's widow, rather. Um, but we don't know if he just purchased, like, rough images that Lemoyne did from memory, if he purchased more accurate images and then just decided to change them anyway, or if Debray even had his hands on them at all. And um, also, if we think about motives, Debray uh, certainly had reason to claim that he engraved these after Lemoyne, because an eyewitness account would be easier to promote and sell than a secondhand account. Uh, and also, since he's adding backgrounds and things, like a, a more visually appealing, detailed image is more marketable than like a, a rough, boring sketch. Um, so some scholars argue that there's no convincing evidence that Debray ever had access to the Florida paintings. And others argue that even though there are a lot of inaccuracies in the Florida um, engravings, there are many aspects of the Tamuqua's representations that are verifiable if you compare them against other evidence. Um, so they think that there's still some reason to believe that there's some legitimacy to these um, engravings. And just in general reading about this topic, it's interesting that even in sources where the author like knows the full situation, you can tell that there's sort of this big like desire for the Lemoyne paintings to actually, or for the Debray engravings to actually have been off of the Lemoyne paintings. Just because if, if that were the case, these engravings would be such an amazing resource. Um, and they're also like absolutely ubiquitous in displays about the Tamuqua because they're really the only images that we have. Um, so just in the past two weeks, I saw uh, reproductions of them out in the wild two different times. So this first one was at the Beaches Museum in Jacksonville. And then the second one was uh, just at the library. It was on the new <clears throat> new arrivals shelf. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but however, even if they are fabricated, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't study them. Um, so these are the first images that Europeans saw of Florida shaping their impressions of the Americas. So for that reason, they're undeniably important. Um, and I talked too fast, I guess, so I'm finishing quickly, but uh, <laughs> in conclusion, I, I really like this story because it sort of illustrates the messiness of history, and it shows that a wrench can be thrown into our understanding of the past, and you just have to be flexible as the evidence changes. So, very good. I'll be happy to answer questions. Yes, Joe. Did, did the engravings uh, show that the Tumukwans were much taller than the Europeans? Um, I it says that like in the narratives. Um, but if we go back, I mean, we can look. That's not something I was specifically looking for. I know in the very first engraving, it shows. Oh yeah, he he's pretty tall there. Mm -hmm. He's definitely taller. Um, oops. Where's the one I'm looking for? Oh, yeah, they're shown as like absolutely huge yeah, giants yeah. in this <laughs> one compared to the ships. <laughs> so the perspective on that is crazy, but um, yeah, on all of them, he's a bit taller. Any other questions? Yes. Is there any history regarding the language which was spoken? Um, I don't know. You mean like the Tamukwan language? Um, I don't know that in particular. I'm sure there is, seeing as they know that all of these groups spoke the same language, um, but that wasn't something that I encountered on this research. Any other questions? 
think one of the um, early um, subject of Greece's um, um, like speak the language and also. Oh, yeah, that's true. Good save. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that was one of like the Spanish methods of their colonial project was to learn the native language and to be able to communicate with the native people uh, more effectively and therefore be able to convert them to Catholicism more effectively. Anybody else? Do the um, original engraving still exist? Um, like the plates? I don't think so. Well, I don't know. But I'm assuming since I didn't hear anything about it, probably not. They probably survived because they're copper versus wood. Yeah, that's an interesting question, though. All right. Thank you all for coming. Well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.